Uh, I am a Marseillean from the physics department. We are very happy to have uh, Professor Martin from the University of Virginia to give us this uh, public lecture today. He has been visiting Boston University for the, our famous humanities uh, course. And, uh, well, we made very good use of that opportunity and asked the Mantis group and uh, Professor Whittle whether he would spare his time and give us this lecture. And thank you very much for doing so. And uh, please. Thank you very much, Alpha. Um, in fact, I wanted to formally thank Professor Sergen for inviting me. It's, uh, I was delighted to get the invitation and I've been having a wonderful time here. I had, a, um, I think, a, a nice humanities lecture yesterday and I have another one tomorrow. And if, though I see certainly some of the students that hear from that, um, this is actually, in a sense, uh, continuing the same kind of theme from those two lectures. So it's it's uh, complementary to them. Um, I also apologize to them as well that you may be hearing uh, just a little bit uh, that's similar and repeated because I need to set the stage and that's going to be common material from this lecture and the one from, this, from, from uh, yesterday. So the topic of my talk um, is ultimately what I'm aiming to do is to take you all back to within a million years of the Big Bang. It's an incredibly different time then, so I'm going to take some effort, I think, to paint a realistic picture for you, what it would have been like to float around out there at a time before stars and galaxies had yet formed, and take in the scene. And it turns out, the sounds as well, there are sounds present. Um, and here we are 14 billion years later, so there's a very, very great gulf in time between today's world, the world of this room right now, and the world of the first million years. And so I'm, I'm going to start here. I need to uh, introduce you to, um, if you, and or perhaps remind you of, of course, um, today's universe, so we can really understand the contrast to the million-year-old universe. So here is here and now. And I'll just start with a lovely um, photograph from the coastline. Uh, it's a little better than your eyes would pick out, but nonetheless, it's what a regular camera would do with a long exposure. You can see uh, the foreground coastline. But here we have the stars in the sky, and then also this wonderful vision of our own galaxy. We're in our own galaxy. It's, it's metaphorically equivalent to a city, so Human beings might be stars, and they live together in large metropolises uh, or cities, and the galaxy is the equivalent uh, city of stars. A hundred billion of them. If we can lift out and go above the city, look down on Istanbul, for example, you see approximately circular conurbation. Um, and if we look down on our galaxy, we see a beautiful spiral pattern. Uh, there's a whole story to be told about what goes on inside galaxies. That's not my agenda in this particular talk. But I do want to introduce you to you know, this major building block of the, un of the universe. Uh, these are vast, vast systems. The sun, if this, if this were our own galaxy, of course it isn't, because we, we are inside our own galaxy. We would be residing somewhere here on the outskirts. And um, I did this briefly with the class yesterday. Um, if the whole of the solar system were no bigger than this saucer, and if the Earth's orbit were two millimeters across, just a little pinhead really, then our galaxy would be 3,500 kilometers across. So it's a vast system compared to the solar system. Of course, as we look out into the universe, we see many, many other galaxies. In total, the visible number is about 100,000 million. Uh, this is just a region of the sky. You can see it's littered with galaxies. There are probably several hundred galaxies sitting in this piece of the sky. Uh, they tend to gather together via gravity. Gravity is the great social force uh, in the universe. It's the architect of structure. It draws things together. And um, just recently, we've begun to um, construct. I hear the sounds going on, and I see I've got a message from Nikon that I don't really want. There we go. Um, 
we've just constructed really a three-dimensional view of the patterns of galaxies. So um, although this is just a, a piece of the sky with a lot of galaxies on it, it's now been possible to measure the positions of over a million galaxies. Uh, excuse me, not just the positions, but the, but the distances as well. And you combine those together, and you generate sort of galaxy maps, uh, a bit like this one here. This is a sort of slice through the universe. Uh, it's very important to recognize that we are at the center. These are just regions that are hidden from view by our own galaxy. But otherwise, we're able to punch through our own galaxy and look out into the extragalactic world. This whole map contains 30,000 galaxies uh, and is roughly, I'm so sorry, it is roughly a billion light years in dimension. And you can see the sort of topography of the universe here. Uh, it contains um, voids, rare areas where there are very few galaxies, um, areas where there are chains and uh, filaments of galaxies, and there are also clusters. It's a wonderful tapestry. The word tapestry is an appropriate word. Um, it sort of invokes this non-random but non-regular uh, distribution. The other major uh, discovery that's occurred in the last century is this is an old, this, these maps were made about, um, this one was made about seven or eight years ago. So this entire project of mapping the region out to about three or four billion light years has only just happened in the last couple of decades. Uh, but what was discovered in the 1920s was that this whole pattern of galaxies is a dynamic one. It's evolving and it's changing. And so the galaxies are moving. And um, this is going to be the pattern of motion of the galaxies. So there we are, back with our same picture. And I'm now going to uh, put representative uh, velocity vectors on. So the red lines here are uh, Velocities, so you can see this is a big velocity, this is a small velocity, and here's the pattern. I've just picked out a few of them. Every galaxy is participating in this remarkable pattern of motion. You'll notice that all the arrows are directly away from us, and furthermore, galaxies that are close to us are not moving very quickly, whereas galaxies that are further away are moving faster in proportion to their distance. So a galaxy that's twice as far away is a galaxy moving, a galaxy that's twice as far away is moving twice as fast. Three times as far away as the means three times as fast. It's a very, very simple relationship. It's called the Hubble Law, and that's after the Edwin Hubble who discovered it in the 1925-26. There are some wonderful consequences of this law. Um, the first of which is to disabuse you of the um, knee-jerk, the obvious interpretation of this, which is that we are somehow central and everything is moving away from us. And while that might be wonderful for our egos, it turns out to be a flawed perception. Because um, before you conclude that there's something really special about us, you have to ask the question, uh, would another galaxy come to the same conclusion? You need to jump to another galaxy and move with it and ask, what would it witness? And so this, oh, I'm so sorry, the green uh, isn't coming up very well here. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope you can see it. Here's galaxy A, and we are currently sitting on that, and here are the velocity vectors moving away from it, just as the pattern I just described. Galaxy B seems to be moving away from galaxy A as just part of this so-called Hubble flow. But if we want to ask the question, what does B witness, we need to jump to B and then run along with B at B's speed, which is away from us. Away from, excuse me, A, away from A. Let's drop the, the us. So we're on B, we're running along here. Can you see that that is now beginning to catch up this one here? So it's not going to see this one move quite as fast as A, because B is now running towards this one. And similarly, because B is now moving this way, A will appear to be, will appear to be moving backwards. So if you simply, um, actually this is a very straightforward, great drama going on outside. It's very straightforward uh, high school vector adding problem. You just add the vectors. And uh, you might just try that on a piece of paper if you like. And this is what B witnesses. Wonderfully, B witnesses exactly the same as A. And indeed, that's true for all galaxies. This particular velocity pattern is a principle of deep galaxy egalitarianism. There is no favored place in the universe. There's no favored galaxy or favored location. Or stated a little differently, 
the entire universe is expanding, and there's no central location, at least not that we can identify. You go to anywhere in the visible universe, you will not find that to be central. And there's no edge, as far as we can tell, from where we, where we witness. Everything's equivalent. Actually, it's a cosmological principle. It's elevated to a principle which says the universe appears the same, and statistically is the same, at all locations. It's an isotropic, homogeneous entity. There's no large-scale topography structure, if you like. Um, once you've gone above those mottled patterns, everything is the same. Everything is the same. Now, so these are the conclusions I just want to summarize. Uh, and it's rather important. I'm adding a couple of others here. So every galaxy witnesses the same cosmic expansion. These are consequences of the Hubble law. No central location. But number two, terribly interesting. Number two says, if we track the motion backwards, so, okay, so today, 14 billion years on, this galaxy here is moving at a certain speed. We can ask the question, how long did it take? Sorry, I said that wrongly. Here's a galaxy this far away, and it's moving at a certain speed. How long did it take to get there, starting here, moving at that speed? So this is distance divided by velocity, you get a time. That time is actually about 14 billion years. But the beauty of this little thought experiment is, let's imagine this galaxy now is twice as far away, but it's moving twice as fast. So it took the same amount of time to get there. Pick any galaxy and ask, when did it begin its trajectory from us? You'll come to the same time, 14 billion years. But my statement applies to every other galaxy. So every galaxy was on top of every other galaxy at the same moment in time, about 14 billion years ago. Now that little thought experiment I did made one assumption, which is that the galaxy that's currently moving at this speed this far away has moved at the same speed throughout. Maybe it moved quicker and slowed down, maybe it moved slower and faster and then speeded up. You just have to take my uh, word for it at the moment. We've made those measurements of whether the galaxy s slowed down and then sped up and so on. And so we can refine the 14 million years and it's 13.7 million years plus or minus 1% is the age at which that expansion began. There are other types of evidence that, that uh, pinpoint that time as well. So, this is one of the fundamental pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. I'm waiting for the lights to go out and everything to go silent. There's an electrical storm outside. So, um, so that was the, this is evidence for the Big Bang, the kind of expansion we have. Uh, the third piece of uh, conclusion from this, and it's an obvious one given what I just said, and that is that in the past the universe was denser, a denser place. Everything was busier, everything was closer together. So the current universe we experience today is not for all time, neither in the future nor in the past. The universe is a changing place. It's an evolving place. I'm using the word evolving there not in a Darwinian sense. I'm just meaning change and development in this case. But the universe is a changing environment. Which, of course, is why I'm going to tell you that a million years after the Big Bang, it was radically different than it is today. It is a changing place. Okay. Um, having just uh, mentioned that the universe is changing, sorry, I'm just going back again. Um, we want to immediately ask the question, how do we verify this? Can we actually see or somehow understand what the universe is like in the past? And the answer is, we can. Um, we can actually witness history directly um, it's a sort of, uh, I'm not sure this is a true statement I'm about to make, but it's a very, historians must surely be envious of astronomers because we can actually witness history directly using telescopes. And in a sense, telescopes are a kind of time machine. They allow us to access the distant past for a very simple reason. Light, although light moves very, very quickly, it does not move infinitely fast. And these galaxies can be very far away. It takes a long, long time for the light to get to us. So, for example, thinking nearby, if I'm looking at a star in the sky, the light might have taken 10 years to get to me. So as you're looking at it at night, you see that star as it was 10 years ago, not as it is today. You see the light striking your eye that it set out 10 years ago, the vision you have is one of 10 years back in time. And it's inexorable. Actually, I'm seeing you guys, uh, Alpine, on the front row. You're about 15 nanoseconds in my past. And there is nothing I can ever do to see you now. 
I'm always seeing you 15 nanoseconds ago. Okay, now, in this room, nothing much has changed. In those 15 nanoseconds, you've not left, okay? And the same is true for that star 10 light years away. It hasn't changed much in 10 years. But, if we start, you, you want me to use a different one? Okay. Um, this one doesn't have the lightning conductor through it. <laughs> Um, however, let's imagine looking out to a galaxy, oh, I don't know, 10 billion light years away. You're looking back 10 billion years ago. So that's two thirds of the age of the universe. Perhaps that galaxy was different back then. It's not going to be the same today. You'll never see that galaxy as it is today. You're looking inexorably back in time. And so, actually, uh, astronomers, and I picked this telescope on purpose because it's played a major role in staring out very, very far away. So this is what something like the Hubble Telescope achieves. Here it is on Earth, and it looks out, and it doesn't really matter what direction you pick, every direction as you go further away, you're looking back in time, and then you pick some direction. And so you look very, very far away, and that vision, this image which is here, this is what you see, it's what you photograph with the Hubble Telescope today, that's a little piece of sky. It contains nearby galaxies, and it contains very distant galaxies. And they are spread along a tube, a tube of distance, but importantly, a tube of time. It's a time tunnel. It takes us back. So the most remote galaxies are actually infants. Nearer galaxies are children. Nearer galaxies are adolescents. And OK, so there are nearby galaxies here that are essentially adult. And so you can track all of the history of galaxies that way. That, in fact, was the topic for the humanities course yeah, that lecture yesterday. And I, I showed this, and that was also to illustrate here this galaxy is nearby. We're looking back three billion light years. But this galaxy is nine and a half billion light years. G stands for giga. G stands for giga. That means in billion. It's 9.5 billion light years away. Uh, that's 75% back in history. That's like a teenager. Different than an adult or an old galaxy, let's say. So, one has the question. Now, let's push this to a limit, okay? You zoned out for a few minutes there, come back with me now, because there's a very important question to ask. If we look even further back into time, can we see the Big Bang itself? Can we witness the creation moment itself? Big question, okay? And the answer is, Yes, we can. Okay, we can actually see the Big Bang itself. We just uh... so this. And what I'm about to introduce is a potentially confusing diagram, but it's actually a very useful way of thinking about things. This diagram approximates how astronomers witness the universe. I say astronomers, how we, as humans, we witness the universe. This is the Milky Way galaxy in the middle. And as we look out in distance, we look nearby, there are old, mature galaxies. As we look further out, it doesn't matter, any direction, it doesn't matter, you're looking back in time, you see infant galaxies. I didn't tell you this, I'm so sorry, but the Hubble telescopes can see back to the first, just the edge of the first billion years. So they can't see 200 million years after the Big Bang, but they can see 1 billion years after the Big Bang. Hubble vision stops at that point. Um, and so, uh, actually, even further out are the very very infant galaxies that's visible to the, to the Hubble. And then there are some um, first stars. Now, those have not yet been seen. And then I'm not going to go into the details here of what the dark age is. But this outer boundary, this outer boundary, you'll notice in all directions, is the hot early universe. Okay? It's the hot early universe. So, strangely, in every direction, in a sense, at the end of our vision should sit the Big Bang. Okay? So the immediate question that's in your mind is, could we see it? Was it producing any light that we might witness? And the answer is, it does. The Big Bang was extremely hot and bright. And it was... Uh, glowing immensely brightly. I'll try and reconstruct that for you in a few minutes. But 
Having told you that, you might now be uh, confused because the night sky is not very bright. In every direction you look, it's actually dark between the stars. So there's something happening here, and that is that the light has been traveling, remember, for 14 billion years. And so during that time, as the light's made this long journey to get to us, the universe has expanded. And it's expanded greatly. Remember, the Hubble law tells us the universe is expanding. And it's expanded by a factor of a thousand. So when that light set out, the universe was a thousand times smaller than it currently is. Everything was a thousand times closer. Now, although the light set out as light waves, with a wavelength of about a millionth of a meter, that's typically light wave length, wavelengths, as they crossed, they were embedded in a space which the space was expanding, and those waves got stretched. And they got stretched by the same factor that the universe expanded by. Those waves got stretched by a factor of a thousand. So what was a wavelength of a millionth of a meter becomes a wavelength of a thousandth of a meter. That's well known to be a millimeter, that's what milli means. Millimeter waves are, in fact, micro. If you take light, the same thing, electromagnetic waves, and you just make them longer, you have microwaves. That's another part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So in fact, the light waves are stretched by a factor of a thousand. They leave as light, but they arrive as microwaves. Aha! This is the famous cosmic microwave background. It is the optical flash from the Big Bang, rendered microwaves. And it's in all directions it's coming to us. It's an extraordinary uh, truth. So um, I'm also now going to talk a little bit about the cosmic microwave background. Um, it was very famously discovered, actually by accident, in about 1965 by these two fellows, uh, Penzias and Wilson. Uh, they were actually part of uh, Bell Telephone Labs in New Jersey, in the USA. And they were part of uh, the Telstar program. This was a program that was just beginning to explore satellite communication. And if you wanted to use satellites for telecommunication, you need to be pretty knowledgeable about what radio waves are coming from the sky. And so they designed this telescope to try and figure out what the sky contribution was to the radio emission. And they very famously detected a source of emission for which they could not track its origin. The, the sky itself produces some radio waves, and their detector had a certain amount of noise, but all that added up to only about 60% of the signal. There was a 40% that was missing. And it didn't matter where they looked in the sky or when they looked, it was always the same as a missing 40%. And actually, um, they didn't know what it was. And then Penzias attended a colloquium in Princeton by Jim Peebles, who was a theoretician, and he was talking about whether there will be any relic radiation from a hot big bang, and said, well, we should be seeing it. There should be an omnidirectional, every direction, omnidirectional microwave glow. And Penzias went, oh, that's what I've just found. So in a sense, almost within a matter of minutes, they realized this was the glow from the big bang. Okay? A very, very important discovery. I should say, actually, that at that time, the whole concept of the big bang didn't really have real currency in the astronomic community, but the discovery of the microwave background really transformed that. This became a very, very much more legitimate theory at that time. And since, that's 1965, and since then, there have been 60 years of work on this, and um, in a sense, becoming more and more robust theory. So, with 60 years of, of research, an awful lot has been found, and I'm only going to touch on some of the highlights, uh, some of which have come from uh, American NASA missions. This is the COBE mission, which was flown in 1990, and it made um, an image of the full sky. I know this looks like an oval, don't get confused. That's just all of the panorama, the full 360 degrees of the sky, shown as a map. You know how it is. That could have been the world for the surface of the Earth gets mapped in that shape. And think the only the universe is egg shape, it's not. That's just the sky. And the amazing thing was it's extremely uniform in brightness. This glow was very, very smooth glow, okay, all the way around. I'll come back to that in a minute. The other thing is they did, they took a spectrum of it, uh, and actually these were the two folks, Mather and Smoot, who also got a Nobel Prize 
for this piece of work. And this is so we have uh, frequency here or wavelength, uh, and we have brightness. So these are the data points here, the little data points. And you'll see they go up and they come down. And then there's a line that goes through it. And that line is a very, very simple theoretical curve called a thermal spectrum. If you're doing physics here at the university, uh, it's, a, it's a first or even second first year physics problem to calculate what is this thermal spectrum. There's only one parameter, and that's the temperature. That's one parameter. And uh, this, this shape goes absolutely through every single data point. The universe, the micro background, is the best thermal spectrum emitter known to man. Okay? It's actually difficult to make something better than that in the laboratory. So it's an extraordinary thermal emitter. Once again, that was a very, very important characteristic of the young universe. Um, actually, I'll just take a side step for a moment. Uh, this graph was very first shown in 1990, you know, after the COVID mission was completed. And I was in the auditorium uh, when this graph was first shown. There's about 800 astronomers. It was in a meeting in Washington, D.C. And um, spontaneously, uh, the audience burst into applause and stood up for a minute. That's one thing to give an applause for a bit, but for a minute, that's a long time, okay? People were just thrilled. And the reason was, I think, one was to congratulate the team because it was a huge piece of science to actually do that and do it properly and get the errors down as small as they could. But the other reason was, I think, psychologically, there was a huge sense of relief because a perfect, simple thermal spectrum is simple. It tells us the early universe is, a, is tractable. It's not, it's not so complex we can't deal with it. It's really, it's a vision of simplicity. It means we stand a hope of really understanding what those early times were like. And, and I think people just appreciated nature's simplicity. I think that's part of what was going on. Let me now um, examine a little bit more carefully what the nature of this uh, outer region I showed you before. This is the astronomer's universe, and I suggested that this was sort of the hot early phase. So let me pass that a bit more, dissect it a little bit more. Let's look at this area. And so this rectangle here is really just a slice through this. What is really going on? Remember, in a sense, we're looking at time going out here. I also, I'm sorry. I also suggest you don't think too carefully <laughs> about this particular diagram, it may make you a little bit uh, crazy. So don't, 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 don't be distracted by worrying what's outside it and so on. It's really a slice in space and time. So if you haven't quite figured it out, don't worry about that. But we are just going to look at this little area here. So in a sense, this is time going outwards. And right out here, at the very, very limit, is the hot Big Bang itself. Let's just say the first second. The gas was so hot at that time, it was also ionized, meaning the electrons could not be stuck to their protons. The atoms didn't exist at that time. They were broken apart. It was too hot. Remember what heat is? It's molecular and atomic collisions. If those collisions are too violent, the electrons get broken off. Atoms are not infinitely strong. They get smashed, just like these wine gas glass would get smashed if I hit it hard enough. Atoms can get smashed that way. It's too hot. And uh, when you have a hot gas with just um, electrons, uh, that are not attached to their atoms, the gas is actually foggy. And so it was foggy back then, and it was also glowing because it was so hot. So it's a hot, glowing fog. But as the universe expanded and time went by, here we are, 400,000 years goes by, the universe cools down to about 3,000 degrees. Kelvin, it doesn't really matter, it could be centigrade. Um, but about 3,000 degrees is sufficiently cool for electrons to get caught by the protons to make simple hydrogen gas. So there was a transition from ionized to atomic, to atomic. It occurred quite quickly, but because you're removing the electrons, you're removing the source of fog, the universe turned transparent at that time. The universe turned transparent, the fog lifted. And of course, since it's transparent, light waves can propagate now. Previously, they're bouncing around, it's foggy. They can propagate all the way to us, all the way into us. Let's not forget, of course, during their long journey, although they start out as orange light, which is a 3,000 degree glowing gas. I mean, if you witness 3,000 degrees, it's very, very bright orange, bright white light. Uh, don't forget, cosmic expansion stretches those waves, so they leave the visible part of the spectrum and they arrive in the microwave part of the spectrum. This is just the electromagnetic spectrum with gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, visible infrared 
microwave and radio. So they leave as light and they arrive as microwaves. So what we're looking at, actually, is a wall of fog glowing at 3,000 degrees. And we're not looking at the Big Bang moment itself. We're looking at a time about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That is what the microwave background is. So when I told you you see the Big Bang itself, kind of, no, not really. But it's behind the wall of fog. What we see is the wall of fog, which is actually at 300,000, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Now, this diagram suggests wrongly that it doesn't get the relative times right. I want to give you a feeling for how young the universe was. So here's a timeline with the Big Bang here, 5, 10, 13.7 billion years. Here's now and today. So our telescopes, the, the, Hubble, the Hubble telescope, can look to about here. But here's the CMB. It's coming from a time 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And if this is 13.7 billion, you need to process that ratio. I'll help you. So if we map the full age of the universe onto an 80-year human lifespan, the Hubble telescope is looking at children, but the CMB is 12 hours after conception. So this is pre-gestation in a sense. Very, very young universe. If you went to a human at that time, it would be totally unrecognizable. There's no head or arms or legs or anything like that. It's just DNA. That's it. It was radically different at that time. And so was the universe. Radically different at that time. If you want to use not time but distance as a metaphor, then starting from here, going outwards, you could imagine, I don't know whether you do marathon races, I don't, <laughs> but running 26 miles is a marathon race, you start here, and then you can't quite see the finishing tape. Four feet before the end is where the microwave background is. So if you, if you view the Big Bang as your destination, you collapse four feet before. You can't quite witness the Big Bang itself. But you get very close to it. Very close to it. Okay. So, now let me, having set that all background, I want to now take us back there to the first million years. What was it like? So you have to recognize then, we're going back to very little time. Here's today's universe, uh, just sort of shown really as a, as a cube. It doesn't matter in this particular case, many light years across, we're filled with galaxies. It's mainly empty space and galaxies. On average, it's very cold. But back then, this length was a thousand times smaller. So this volume was a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. That's a billion times tinier volume. And secondly, all of the matter that you see condensed here into galaxies and stars was spread out uniformly. Very important. Today's universe is lumpy. The early universe, all of that was spread out uniformly. And then secondly, on average, it's very cold in today's universe. Back then, it was very hot. So the first million years here, is characterized by bright, hot, smooth gas. It's a very different place to today's universe. What was the composition? First of all, um, there were basically three components that we need to think about. Uh, remember, it's too hot for atoms to form, so we have free electrons, protons, and helium nuclei. At this stage, there were none of the elements that make up you and me, or this room. That's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, and so on in us here. Those all came later. They were made in the stars, made in the centers of stars. The only elements that emerged from the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium. That's another lovely story, how helium got to be made. It was made about three minutes after the Big Bang. <laughs> Sorry, that's another, another topic. Okay. Um, the other thing that was present in huge abundance were photons of light. The Big Bang is a misnomer in a way. The better term might be the Big Flash. Light was enormously dominant in the early universe. It was very, very brilliant. Now, actually, because the gas was foggy, these two components were actually coupled together. Because they were foggy, the light was trapped. It couldn't move freely. And they're coupled together in what cosmologists call the photon-baryon fluid. Baryon is a fancy name for protons, neutrons, and electrons. So these two are tied together. There's really only two components. And the third component here is something I've not mentioned. It's uh, something which is very, very much part of modern astronomy. And that is, um, there was a substance called dark matter was present. These are dark matter particles. There was a substrate of material which actually weighed six times more than all of the weight in protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
And so this is a very interesting component. It's ultimately going to play an important role in the story. And initially, we're going to ignore it, but we'll come back to it in a little bit. So the dark matter is spread about as well. All of these are spread about very uniformly. Something you have to re recognize is inherent in thinking about the young universe is that conditions are changing. They're changing quite rapidly because the universe is expanding. And so, for example, uh, you know, at one moment it might be this big, and then, it, you know, sometime later it's going to be double. That volume is going to expand to be two by two by two, or eight times the volume. And then sometime later it's going to be three by three by three, or 27 times the volume. So the contents of the universe are being spread out. It is thinning out. It's thinning out. There's dilution occurring. I don't, I mean, this, di this figure would make it something else. I'm characterizing it by a thing called the scale factor. But you can see the density is dropping. As the, as the universe doubles in size, the density is going to drop by an eighth. If you triple in size, it's going to drop by 27. Rapid dilution happening. So conditions are changing. So let's talk about what some of those conditions were. Um, we used to be in a, a relatively uniform gas, like the gas in this room right now. It's an atmosphere, it's pretty uniform. I'm breathing it. Um, what was the atmosphere like back then? What was the density? So here we are going to show you a number of diagrams that track us across the first million years. Okay, that's a thousand, but we're in killer years here. So a thousand killer years is a million. This is the first million years. That's the title of the talk, of course. And the graph shows how big the universe was with the green curve. So you can see roughly around 400,000 years, you can see we're 0.1%, this is in percent, but 0.1% of the size of today's universe. There we are. There's that factor of 1,000. 0.1% is 1,000. So everything was 1,000 times closer. Okay? But it's changing. It was much smaller back here, and it's getting bigger all the time. And of course, this graph, by the time you go to 13.7 billion years, we arrive at 1. So it's 0.1% of today, of today's size. So everything's 1,000 times smaller. Well, obviously, the gas gets diluted. And this is the dropping density of gas in protons per cubic centimeter. So you'll notice that a sort of around 400,000 years, it's about two or 300. Here's a two squared is 100, that's 1,000, there's 10,000. So it's a few hundred protons and neutrons, excuse, protons or electrons per cubic centimeter. So per cubic centimeter, that's the size of a sugar cube, two or 300, which is actually very few, very few. This gas is very tenuous. I don't know whether you know this, but inside a cubic centimeter in front of your nose right now, there are 10 to the power 19 protons and neutrons and electrons. 10 to the 19 has 200 back then. It's a very diluted gas. It was actually more diluted than the best vacuum we could make. So already, the universe is pretty thin, even 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So here's a question. The whole gas is at 3,000 degrees. I'm picking, you know, I'm picking 400,000 years. It's 3,000 degrees. Would it burn you? If you were sitting there, would it burn you? Okay. And the answer is no, it wouldn't. Because even though you have your hand out there, there are not many particles hitting it. They hit it hard because it's 3,000 degrees. That gives it the thwack, the kinetic energy of the particle hitting. But there's not many in the cubic centimeters. So actually, you could hold your hand out and it wouldn't get burnt at all. I've actually put the energy going into your hand. It's, you know, 1, 2, 3, 0.3 milliwatts. That's not very much. You wouldn't get burnt out. However, you'll notice that it's all colored yellow here because there's a lot of photons, there's a lot of light around. So let's hold our hand out there. It's not going to get burned by the gas, but yikes, we get burned by the light. That's a megawatt, okay? I haven't done the math. It would be a nicely morbid thing to do. How long would your hand survive with a megawatt going into it? I don't know, a few milliseconds before it was evaporated. It's very intense heat. Very intense. So when I say I'd like to take you back there, obviously I'm not meaning it literally, and you need to sort of modify the way you think about how you would experience it. It's very, very intense heat, but it comes mainly from the light. In fact, let's turn to the light now. The title of this lecture was First Million Years Primordial Light and Sound. I'll come to sound later. So what kind of colours might the universe have looked like? I said there's a lot of light there. This is a famous, these are all these um, so-called thermal spectra. So this is wavelength, color, and here's the optical range, going from red, orange, yellow, green, blue. So long waves to shorter waves. We include infrared here as well. 
And these are the typical spectra, the thermal spectra you get from objects at 3,000 Kelvin, at 4,000 Kelvin, at 5,000 Kelvin. This is exactly the kind of temperatures we're talking about back in the first million years. In fact, you can sort of get some sense of what thermal radiation is about. Here's uh, an iron, uh, I don't know whatever it is, it's a hook or something. And obviously it's come straight out of the bellows, and so it's glowing because it's hot in comparison to its neighbors, which are not. And this is sufficiently hot to begin to give us a little bit of radiation uh, in the optical. Most of this will actually be in the infrared, it will peak over here. So certainly the heat of the early universe is producing light. These two things are inherently intertwined. Now, remember I talked about that redshift. Um, this illustrates what happens to that spectrum over the course of cosmic history. Now, I, 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 in, a, in a way, I apologize. I've switched axes now. So these are now what are called exponential axes. You'll notice there's a factor of a 10, and a factor of a 10, and a factor of a 10, and factors of 10 to the 10 here. That's the same thermal spectrum just shown on a sort of logarithmic plot. And here it is, a 3,000 Kelvin spectrum, which peaks in the near infrared. There's a lot of optical light there. That's coming at, four, at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That's the radiation field you're experiencing. But then you'll notice that redshift actually brings, excuse me, the cosmic stretching of all of those waves takes that right to the right and down. It stretches all the waves and it decreases the intensity. And so today's spectrum that we witness that comes to us is three degrees Kelvin. And the, you follow the numbers there. We go from 3,000 Kelvin to three Kelvin. That's a factor of 1,000. That's exactly what we're talking about. The wavelengths get stretched, it's the same thing. The temperature gets stretched. So you'll notice this spectrum is now sitting in the microwave part of the spectrum. So in a sense, we are in this oven, but the oven is now a cold one. It's three Kelvin, because those waves have been stretched. It's thermal radiation, a lovely thermal spectrum but the temperature of it is three degrees Kelvin. This may previously have been a source of confusion for you, and I'll just spell out how you might have been used. Okay, so the microwave background has this, it's three degrees Kelvin, this is often a word you may have you know, heard in popular science. How does that jive with a hot early universe? Three Kelvin is nearly liquid helium temperature, that's very cold. Well, it's just because we're in an expanding universe and it's stretched the waves, but it was 3,000 Kelvin when it set out. So in a way, you could say, you could thank, uh, thank God for expansion, because if it wasn't, if the universe wasn't expanding, our, our, our location here, we would be surrounded by a 3,000 degree radiation field. This would be equivalent to us living inside a 3,000 Kelvin furnace. But fortunately, because of expansion, we survive. Uh, those of you who are in the physics will may recognize when you redshift the spectrum, the intensity drops as the, uh, the redshift to the fourth power. So what was a megawatt per square meter becomes a, a microwatt. It's 10 to the 12 times bigger. So, um, and in, in a sense, sitting in there is what it would have been like had we been there back then. Just to make this more real to you, here we have the first million years. And let's do this one first. So this axis here is the sky brightness in noonday suns. And this is the graph that, that the universe follows. You need to imagine yourself floating out there, looking out at the sky. How bright is it? Well, it's a million times brighter than the noonday sun, about 50,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, at our time of 400,000 years after the Big Bang, we're nearly 10,000 times brighter than the noonday sun. The way to think about this is just imagine the sun in the sky, but we only have one sun there. You need to fill every single gap in the sky with the sun. And that is the radiation field from a 5,000 degree thermal emitter. That's what the sun is. It's 5,800 Kelvin. In order to experience the radiation field of the young universe, you need to cover the sky in the sun. This is a very, very intense place back then. Okay? And also, of course, the temperature's dropping uh, because of the expansion. It's uh, redshifting all the, the light. And so the very early universe was blue hot. And it became green hot, and yellow hot, orange hot, red hot, crimson hot. And of course, today it is microwave hot. It's all the same story. It's all the same idea. 
So the sky colours wonderfully shifted through all the rainbow sequence that we know, starting with blue and then going backwards to red as the universe cooled. It's really quite a dramatic place to be. I mean, had you been able to survive? <laughs> we wouldn't have done, but that's okay. You could imagine some uh, being back there appreciating the sky colour changing every few hundred, every few tens of thousands of years. I've also mentioned that it's foggy, so if you were to look at something far away, they gradually become invisible. It's like being in a cloud. Whenever you fly through a cloud, you can't see very far. And remember, I mentioned that's because the electrons are acting like the water droplets. Here's a morning mist. Um, I understand this Istanbul has this very frequently. The more humidity is high, you have a morning mist. What? So water droplets are scattering light, so you can't see through any column of air very easily. And the, of course, there were no water droplets back then. What they were were free electrons, and they're playing just the same role as water droplets in a mist. But remember, the mist clears, and so that wonderful event of clearing of the morning mist in the universe's life occurs around 400,000 years. And it's very simple to understand why. I sort of went through it briefly before. At 300,000 years, it's actually 4,500 Kelvin, so it's hotter. And now, you'll know that all the electrons are free, and they're causing the fog. When you come to this temperature, 100,000 years later, it's cooled, and now about half the electrons are attached to their protons and helium nuclei. And by the time you're at 500,000 years, it's sufficiently cool, you'll notice all the electrons are now attached to their atoms. We've formed atoms now, and the gas is transparent, so the fog is clear. All right. So far, I've sort of stressed the fact that the universe is very uniform, very, very homogeneous. Uh, if, you were, if you're standing there, it would just... The, same brightness all the way around, beneath your feet, up there, just there's no structure to see, but that's not quite true. And a very slight lumpiness. Now today's universe is extremely lumpy. I mean, I'm standing here, and there's a big gap in density, it drops by a factor of a thousand, and then we jump up again when we get to the next person, and we're all separated by gaps, and stars are separated by space. It's a very lumpy place. And those lump that lumpiness um, must have been present in the young universe, because gravity needs something to act on, to amplify. So if we see a lumpy universe today, there must have been some slight lumpiness back in the young universe uh, in order to make the lumpiness of today. And so um, there was enormous effort put into studying the microwave background to see if you could witness slight differences in brightness in one location and the next location, one location and the next location. And after about 30 years of work, the, the micro background was finally found to be lumpy by the COBE satellite, and this was very much more mapped in detail in 2003. So here is the um, basic microwave image of all the sky. It's very, very smooth. But if you contrast stretch it by 200,000 times, so we have to really stretch the contrast, really look very, very uh, carefully at the tiny, tiny fluctuations in brightness. Here they are. The whole microwave background becomes patchy. And here's a little region of it now. You can see it's all patchy. The slightly brighter regions are slightly darker regions, slightly brighter and slightly darker. Those reveal slight roughness in the density, differences in density, one location to the next. And ultimately, gravity is going to act on these and where it's slightly denser, you're going to form a huge cluster of galaxies. And where it's slightly less dense, that will become a void between the galaxies. So that pattern I showed you, the map of 30,000 galaxies, that has its origins back in the microwave background in that tiny patchiness. Okay. Now that's one way of looking at the patches. There's another equivalent uh, and interesting way of looking at it as well. The patches are also the peaks and troughs of sound waves. So, for example, right here, you'll notice it's a bit brighter. That means it's a bit hotter and a bit denser, and that means that the pressure is a bit higher. If you know basic physics, P is nT, with Boltzmann's constant. It's density times temperature. So the fact that it's slightly denser and slightly hotter means it's slightly higher pressure. Conversely, that's slightly lower pressure. But pressure is sound, sound waves. So there are sound waves that are present back there, and you can see them. Because the peak of a, excuse me, the peak of a pressure wave glows a bit brighter. 
So it makes a bit more microwave emission. I mean, it makes it more light, which becomes microwave emission. And then the trough of a sound wave, where the pressure is lower, that glows a bit more dimly. And it becomes a slight, you know, well, it's coded as blue, obviously it's coded brightness in the microwave part of the spectrum. So all of those patches, you can think of them a bit like many, many waves, all superposed, some long waves, short waves, medium-sized waves. They're all added together in a random higgledy-biggledy manner. Now, this is the surface of water, so please don't be confused here. This is not up and down in space. These are high and low pressure regions, but I'm wanting to, give, I'm wanting to evoke the sense there are many waves present, all combined in random waves, just like looking at uh, the surface of the water. So, how were these sound waves made? Okay, why was there sound? And um, you may be thinking this is sort of non-question, or it's an obvious one. And that is, you may be thinking, well, it is after all called the Big Bang. Maybe there was a bang, and this is the sound that's left over from it. And I'm afraid to say, while you may think that, it is utterly wrong. Okay, that's not what's going on. If you actually want to ask, did the Big Bang make any sound itself, the answer is no, it didn't. It was a silent event, interestingly. The sound develops later. It develops later. So how does it develop? This is where I sort of reintroduce that topic of the dark matter, and, and without looking too much at this at the moment. When I'm making sound here in my voice, um, mus muscles are forcing air through my via my diaphragm, through my vocal cords. It's muscular energy is ultimately pushing air. Back in the young um, universe, the driving force for the sound wave is in fact gravity. Gravity is just so much in action in all times in cosmic history, and it's in action creating the primordial sound as well. Now, the way this works is that not only is the gas slightly um, distributed unevenly, most importantly, the dark matter is as well. So you've got to think of this dark matter as sort of some permeating three-dimensional fluid with slightly higher density areas and slightly lower density, slightly higher light, slightly lower, and sort of three-dimensional patchwork model all over the place. And the gas that's surrounding, sorry, so this illustrates there's four highly idealized regions of excess dark matter. And this is a ridiculous diagram in the sense that it suggests there's enormous density contrast between this and then that and this and then that. It's not. These are slightly denser regions and slightly less dense regions. This image here is to hopefully to evoke for you the feeling that there is a gravitational trough into which things could fall. Things are being pulled into this and things are being pulled into that and away from here and into that. So these are centers of gravitational attraction. You could imagine a ball rolling into the hill. That's, that's the intention of this diagram. The green is to show you where the gravitational pull is. And so the gas, so the gas falls into these gravitational attractive pockets made by the dark matter, and then they bounce out again. The gas falls in, compresses, and bounces back out again. In fact, I've got a better diagram here. So you imagine a piece of, uh, just looking at a piece of the space there, the grey is showing you what the dark matter is doing. It's slightly denser, darker grey here. And then the particles here are the protons and electrons and photons. This is the baryon, photon, photon baryon gas. So there's a slight dip, it's like a gravitational valley here, and the gas falls into it and falls into it. Because it's coming from both sides, you see it compresses in the middle. And when you compress, it heats the gas and makes it glow a bit brighter. So the microwave background will appear a little bit brighter here. But then, a little bit later on, the gas actually pushes back out again, and you'll notice that it comes up here, and it leaves a hole, a gap here, that's a rarefaction. And so this will then appear dimmer in the microwave background. And the whole thing repeats itself. The gas is falling in and bouncing out, and falling in and bouncing out. So these are spherical sound waves, driven by gravity, caused by dark matter. You can think of the dark matter lumps as organ pipes. There are little ones in which the gas is bouncing in quickly. Now, there are big ones in which the gas falls in and bounces out more slowly. These are going to be low notes, and the little dark matter patches are going to give high notes. So there's a whole register of organ pipes, small, medium, and large. So there are many, many notes being played. Because there are many notes being played, actually, sorry, let's just, uh, uh, 
Yes, right. Sorry, so here's a thought. If you went back then and tried to listen to the sound in sound waves pulsing, um, as a human being, you would hear nothing. Well, I mean, apart from the fact you would die because of the light. But in any case, even if you could sort of survive that, the, the waves are too, far too deep. These frequencies are, take between 20,000 years and 400,000 years. So they're very, very deep, deep notes. Okay? It takes a long time for the gas to be fall in and bounce out. That's actually about 50 octaves below what the human beings can hear. 50 octaves. Um, and here's a simple explanation for why that is. Uh, basically, when you're blowing in a... Uh, when you're making sound, when you have little pipes, basically the oscillations are very fast, and you have a high pitch, and you have a low pitch, and then if you want to go even bigger, you have an organ here, and the biggest pipes are making the deepest notes. I think we all know that. That's not a, a thing from, um, a strange. So now you ask, well, how big are the organ pipes in the universe? Well, when the universe is about 400,000 years old, the biggest pipes that are sounding are about 400,000 light years across. That's the size of the biggest notes. So that's why they're so deep. It's because the organ pipes that are allowed to sound are as big as light can have traveled since the Big Bang. That's 400,000 years. So the universe's <coughs> organ has its major register made of organ pipes that are about 400,000 light years across, and then many smaller ones as well. Now you might ask now, how can we figure out what the sound is like? And so, basically, it's very straightforward. I'm going to generate here, uh, sorry, so here, here is the actual microwave background, and it's the superposition of big waves, medium waves, and little waves. They're all on top of each other here. So to simplify it, I've separated them. Here are two huge waves, actually enormous, and those are going to appear on a sound spectrum with very low frequency. So this will produce a big peak on what is going to be a sound spectrum with deep notes and high notes and loudness up here. Loudness and deep notes and high notes. This will be frequency, actually. And let's not worry about what these actual terms are. So here are some medium waves, and they're going to contribute in this part of the sound spectrum. And here are some tiny waves, and they're going to contribute over there. But in truth, of course, we have them all present and guess what? A computer can actually sort it all out and show us which waves are present and which are not, which pictures are present and which are not. This is a standard piece of sound analysis that you could do on a musical instrument. Okay? So, this is the result that's found. Now, you may not have seen this graph before, but let me tell you, trying to achieve this graph and find it was a holy grail for... 30 or 40 years in cosmology. This is an extraordinary graph I'm showing you here. And I know I've shown a lot of different graphs, some are more fundamental than others, but this is a remarkable thing. This is the voice print of the young universe, the voice print of it. So here we have um, patch size from big patches on the microwave background to small patches. Let not, let's not forget what that means. These are big waves, these are deep sounds, and these are small, high-pitched sounds. And this is the loudness of the particular pitch. And this is the data, the data of the dots. Now, it's true, when we get to about here, these data begin to have error bars associated. And let me tell you, the most recent data, this is 2008, those error bars are now much smaller and we go up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down to about here. The remarkable thing is, and then, excuse me, the line that goes through is actually a computer's model of the young universe. So there's a couple of things to recognize here. Let's just deal with the reality, first of all. You'll notice that there's a peak and some other peaks. So I'm going to use musical language, which is appropriate. This is the fundamental tone, and these are harmonics. Remarkably, the primordial sound has a musical quality, because noise would be just a broad spectrum here with all frequencies present. And a good musical instrument would have just a few notes present within it, like fundamentals and harmonics. The universe is actually a cross between the two. It is, there is a broad aspect to it, but there are also tones that are present. It's a remarkable aspect of nature to do this. It's also a remarkable aspect of human achievement that the theoretical model goes right through the data. This really tells you we do understand what's happening. A lot of physics which goes into that, we're not going to go into that in detail. 
but that's the product of a, of a computer model which tries to get all the physics right. And you can see that it's actually pretty good at generating the uh, sound spectrum from the young universe. We think we understand fairly well how that sound comes about. So anyway, let's begin to have some fun now. So if you want to turn the sound um, on. So, um, oh dear, just a second. We have a little few problems with interference here. So, um, one thing that one can do then is ask what did it sound like? Uh, we've got, after all, we've got the sound spectrum. Uh, the volume, which I didn't tell you about, is actually about um, 100 decibels. Uh, so that's actually rock concert volume. It's not quiet, but it's not lethal. It's just in between. It's powerful. Now, we, we won't achieve 100 decibels, but we'll get... We'll get ah, we have a delay on this. It's, um... So anyway, so let's just play the raw sound, just straight from this spectrum, as measured off the microwave background. Okay, this is what it sounds like. sensitive to narrow harmonics, principally because the voice track produces very narrow harmonics. So when I go or something like that, if you did a sound spectrum of that, very narrow harmonics. We've got broad harmonics here, so that's why it has a noise-like character to it. Um, I'm going to explore all that in a bit more detail uh, in a few minutes, but let me, let me come to what cosmologists really wanted out of that uh, sound spectrum, and that is to measure the properties of the universe. Uh, I just want to illustrate. Uh, okay, so let's, why don't we just turn the sound off for a minute? Okay, off for a minute. So I just want to illustrate this um, because that sound spectrum, with all its humps and bumps, is incredibly useful at measuring the properties of the universe, at measuring the properties of the universe. And the principle is very straightforward. If uh, different objects make different sounds, and I'm just going to hit two different objects. Now, you were using your eyes actually to help your brains immediately say, oh, one's a wine glass and one's a cup. But even if you have your eyes closed, you probably would have guessed the second uh, was made of glass and the first was ceramic because they vibrate differently. If you were a very clever physicist and you took a sound spectrum, you could actually figure out the shape of that and its size, certainly its size from its pitch, that would be easy. Um, but you would also get probably the structure of it and so on, just because the sound is different. And now your ears are doing a, a crude sound spectrum, but in a real spectrum, you have a lot more information to deal with. And so the same is true with the universe. Different universes produce different kinds of sound. And so you want to do the reverse problem we have the sound spectrum from the universe. Can we figure out what its structure? Don't misunderstand me. It's not going to come out as a wine glass or a teacup. But the principle is there. The principle is there. So, um, here are just, uh, a few of the fundamental parameters that come out. Uh, and I'm going, to show, I'm going to play some acoustic versions of them. So here's the sound spectrum as measured. And let me just tell you, if you change the total density of the universe, how dense the matter is spread about, it changes the fundamental pitch. This is the fundamental tone, and it has a particular pitch, and that moves lower or higher depending on the density of the universe. These are parameters that a cosmologist use. If you're in physics and astronomy, you'll recognize them, omega total, okay? However, the universe is comprised of different components. That glass has silicon and oxygen and different components in it we can measure the relative amounts of those components. So for example, the fraction of dark matter that's present in the universe makes the fundamental go stronger or weaker. So by matching the right height, we can measure the amount of dark matter in the universe. The relative strengths of the second and third harmonics tells you how much atomic matter is present in the universe. You'll see all of these parameters, omega atomic, omega matter, omega total, are all telling us the relative amounts of material in the universe. And so actually an acoustic version of this, uh, I'll show you, here are three different universes, so we'll need the sound back on again. Here's three different universes, 
um, of slightly different uh, total density. Ready? And I think we start with this one, which is the low density universe. <laughs> bingo, you measure the total density of the universe. Now, you may think that's an esoteric parameter. Who cares what the density is? Let me tell you, the density fixes whether the space in which the universe is made is Euclidean or non-Euclidean, whether it's a curved, total, finite universe, or whether it's an infinite universe, whether the rules of geometry follow those of Euclid or Riemann. This is not a trivial issue. It tells us the nature of the space, okay? So um, it's not just the density that's much more important is to actually tell us the kind of space that the universe uh, is embedded within. Incidentally, if I go back to this, you'll see that the peak is actually measured very accurately within a 1% location there. That means we're able to measure the geometry of the space very accurately and within 1% accuracy. 1% accuracy on omega total, the space is Euclidean. We live in a space which, for which, fortunately, high school geometry works. Okay. So you don't have to worry. I know you got, you're interested in other spaces, um, but you do topology. So it, it's okay, you don't need to do them. Okay. The, the Euclidean, Euclidean geometry is adequate. Let's do one that's more subtle. Here are three universes, which are otherwise identical, but one contains 2% atomic component, that's protons, neutrons, and electrons. The other is 4%, and the other is 8%. This is more subtle. You'll notice we're not going to be shifting the overall term, because the overall density is set, but we are changing the relative amount of atomic matter. See if your ears can hear the difference now. Ready? Okay. Do you want to just... So your ear is not very good at actually picking out the atomic content of the universe, but look at the data. Excuse me, look at the, the, these, these curves, they're radically different. You can easily, when you go back to this guy, you can easily pinpoint that. And it comes out at 4%. That's one of the reasons we think that the universe has 4% of its content is in atomic matter. Actually, incidentally, there are three other completely independent ways of measuring it. Completely independent, they all come up with 4%. It's one of the really ways in which you really think you're on the right track. You have very, very different approaches to measuring the same thing, and you come up with exactly the same answer. Okay, it needs to be that way, but it turns out it is. So, here are some of the parameters that emerge from this kind of analysis now. Um, so, you, you, this and other analyses give us the age of the universe, and here's the uncertainty currently. Here's the flatness, that's what I meant by the, uh, the, the nature of the geometry. Here's the atomic content, 4% with a 2% error on that. Dark matter, 22% of the universe is dark matter, with a 3% error. These are, old, these are old numbers, actually. It's much better now. These, were, these numbers come from about five years ago, I think. The expansion rate, oh, never mind. There are other properties here. The time in which the microwave background uh, uh, is seen, 380,000 years, with a 1% uncertainty. You notice that these are not very large uncertainties. That's why. There's a common phrase used now in modern cosmology. It's called the era of precision cosmology. You've got to appreciate that 20 years ago, some of these numbers, this number, the famous Hubble constant, wasn't known to within a factor of two. There were groups that were thinking it was 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and there were groups that thought it was 100. And the data couldn't sort it out. And now we're down at sort of 5%, 3%, 2% on the fundamental cosmological parameters. It's been a, an amazing transformation in the last uh, 15 years, which has brought up a degree of focus in the subject, which garners this name, the era of precision cosmology. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, yes, yes. So let's have some more fun now and actually make, make these 
sounds more musical for us. You know, it help our ears a little bit. So here's the fundamental problem with us trying to hear music in this. The harmonics are actually very fat, very broad. I know this looks a little different, that's because I've put this on a decibel scale, which is a logarithmic scale now, not the previous one. So they look a little different, but they're exactly, exactly the same. These are the cosmic uh, harmonics and fundamental. And then here's a flute. This is the sound spectrum of the flute. So here's loudness and decibels and pitch going here. I, if you don't know what this is, 500 hertz, that's about this. Okay, that's about 500 hertz. Uh, 200 hertz, okay, so that just gives you some sort of range. Um, so let's just listen. This is what the cosmic sound is. Oh, sorry. Hello. Wake up. Yep, thank you. fundamental pitch, but one's the cosmic harmonics and one is the flute harmonics. So just the fact that they're narrower makes it sound like a note, as opposed to being rough. I'll just do that again. Sorry, it's a bit loud. Okay, so now we're ready to actually do, do the sound, we'll see what it sounds like. So here is the, um, here's the sound that we get. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip uh, a detail here, which doesn't really concern us. So here's the raw sound present in the gas. And here it is, with the harmonics narrowed to help us hear the chord. You can actually do a, a musical analysis of the ratios of these notes, you'll notice they look almost equally spaced in frequency, but they're not quite, and the lower one is stretched down. It turns out that, musically speaking, that lies between a major and a minor third, if you're in the, the Western musical language here, between a major and a minor third. It's kind of ironic and interesting in a way, because it actually changes over time, as we'll come to in a moment. Uh, major chords are associated with buoyancy and happiness, and minor chords are associated with gloom and gloom sadness, and uh, it turns out the universe modulates from, uh, it starts out um, sad and ends up happy, which is kind of nice. <laughs> and it starts out closer to a minor third and then it's a major third. Okay, let's, let's, let's progress here. So, I just mentioned that those were sounds that were present at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That's at a single time. We just dipped in there and listened to the sound of that time. What was the sound like earlier? Now, you have to realize we cannot now see this. Because we see the wall of fog, we can't look into the fog. So it's not observationally accessible to us. But remember, those computer models, they did a pretty good job of matching the patterns uh, at 400,000 years. So you're pretty confident we know what the sound was like earlier. So you use the computer models to access the earlier sound. So let me just pick three times, and then I'll string them together into the whole sequence. So here's the sound of 350,000 years. Hello? Let's jump back to 60,000 years. Okay, let's go right back to 5,000 years. What's happening is, 5,000 years after the Big Bang, the biggest organ pipes that are sounding are only 5,000 light years across. That's much smaller than later on. Later on, they're 400,000 light years across. So merely the fact that time is evolving is meaning the biggest organ pipes that are, being, that are able to sustain a sound wave are actually getting bigger with the passage of time. And so that's why earlier on, the pitch is higher and higher. Uh, it's because of time's imposition of a limit to the bass notes that are being played. More notes are being added to the register as time passes, deeper and deeper notes are being added. So obviously the fun thing to do now is to, is to uh, play the whole lot. So once what you're gonna see here then is a, a graph of the sound spectrum. This is loudness and this is pitch. Uh, and we're going to follow a trackable from 
age zero, 100 years after the Big Bang. We start 100 years after the Big Bang. We go forward to about 400,000. This is the color of the universe. At 100 years, it was very hot. It was X-ray hot. Okay, I haven't talked about the earlier times, but that's where this is starting. Anyway, let's just play this now. Okay? Yep. So um, the, uh, it's possible now to narrow the harmonics and follow them over time as well. And um, I did this as part of uh, a project that's just been done in, in America to actually create a choral work which is based on this. So I want to show you a little bit about that. So what, what, we, what I've now done is taken those first eight harmonics which were dropping down, and I've narrowed them in pitch, so that now we can hear the musical version. Now, I'm sorry, it's always computer can create creative, so it's always made out of sine waves, and that gives it a slightly sterile feel, and I'm sorry about that. But um, this is what it's, those first eight harmonics sound like. We're mapping them onto 400,000 years. You can see the x-axis here, 400,000 years. And this is to give you an idea of the pitch, this is the piano keyboard that's been turned on end, and so this is the full range of the piano, and here come the harmonics down as the time goes by. The pitch is dropping, and this is the fundamental tone. Here's the first harmonic, the second harmonic, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and incidentally, if you see these blue lines, they go with this scale. Each harmonic has its own loudness. They're not all varying with the same loudness, okay? And then furthermore, each time one of the notes on our piano is crossed, a note is sounded. You'll hear a beep, and then it's held a little bit. So you're able to hear the individual notes articulated, and then they're sustained, so you'll hear a chord as well. Here we go. It sounds a little bit funny, but there we go. Why did that not work? Let's try again. Sorry, I'm going to start that problem. There we go, let's go. You can see where we are with the trackable here. We're up to about 20,000 years. And these are, it's very rapid initially. Now the whole thing lasts five minutes. I went and flicked that on you. I'll just pull, pull us down here somewhere. now being articulated more at the great intervals of time. There we go, there was that one I think. versus trying to be artistic. Okay? It's not my job to be artistically rendering this, um, but I do try and stay as honest to the science part as I can. So all those frequencies were appropriate, they were the right amplitude and so on. And then uh, a, a colleague, I'm not really a colleague, but she's become a colleague in the sense that uh, she was a sound artist. Uh, would you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, um, 
collaborated with a composer, and she took essentially that data that I just showed you, all of those eight harmonics dropping, and wrote a choral work for 30 voices in eight, par eight parts of those eight harmonics. And um, then it was performed in a, in a this, is the, this, is, this is the score, and I picked some part of the score. You can actually see the notes uh, sliding down the scale slightly, and there's, there's marks here for for sforzando, how loud is it, how quiet is it, and there's a tremolo, and so on. So there was a fairly high degree of attempting to be honest to the true sound, but at the same time there was uh, interpretation as well. You can see here's a, a clip that's uh, taken from the, there was an organ, it was performed in a church, uh, and there's some of the uh, choir, and I had a little problem, just uh, may or may not be able to do this. Let me see if we've got, yes, here we are. So I have a, a bit of a video of this. So, uh, well, let's just start there. Do you want to put the sound on? Incidentally, the, the microwave background is fairly bright in the sense that if those microwave photons were actually light, they'd be as bright as the full moon. You could walk outside and you would cast a shadow by the flash from the Big Bang. In reality, it's just the fact your eyes don't send, you're not sensitive to microwaves. That's, that's all that's blocking you from the experience of casting a shadow by the light of creation. And when you do walk outside next time under a dark sky, just think about the microwave photons that are hitting you. They've traveled 14 billion years and they'll, they'll, you'll cast a shadow by them. Um, it was a very different early universe. Everywhere was a hot thing, glowing gas, a brilliant light, dark matter. 
and electrons. It was incredibly bright. Um, near 380,000 years, atoms form, and the fog clears. Right there, that's a lovely metaphor as well. The mist, the morning mist lifts, and now we can see across the universe. Um, there was slight unevenness in the dark matter, and the glowing gas bounces in and out of the pockets, making sound waves. And it's possible to measure the sound spectrum from the microwave background, in the sense the sound spectrum of the young universe. And that um, is used to very great effect by modern cosmologists to measure all sorts of parameters of the universe. And I think I'll close there. And I apologize for having gone over time. I didn't really judge this very well, I'm sorry. Dark energy and dark matter, they are fundamental. Not, it's not really known what they are. That's the first statement. There's a degree of ignorance about what their nature is. Take dark matter first. It is thought to be um, a kind of particle which belongs to a category of particles which has not yet been discovered. They're called supersymmetric particles. So they are thought to be a parallel set of particles to the, all the particles we know about. Quarks, leptons, uh, photons, W and Z particles. All the particles of the standard model. It is thought that, and there is some reason to really trust this, but not certainly, that there's another set of particles to go with those. And it's thought that the lightest of these is stable. The heavier ones are, are, are uh, unstable and they decay just like the muon decayed to an electron. In the early universe, all particles are made. There's enough energy and there's enough interaction to make all particles, including these supersymmetric ones. They decay, and the last one survives into the today's universe. It's unusual to us because the particle doesn't interact by the strong force or the electromagnetic force. It only interacts by the weak force and gravity. So it behaves in a rather unusual way. There's dark matter in this room right now, though not much. And it doesn't really interact with us. For that reason, it took a long time to even realize that it existed. But now there's multiple lines of evidence from astrophysics that it's a major building block for the universe. So I hope I've, I've sort of characterized dark matter. Dark energy, the story is worse. There's very good evidence now that there's a component of the universe whose primary quality is it does not dilute with expansion. Those diagrams I showed you where the, the cube became two by two by two and then three by three by three, and I said the density dropped to one over eight and then one over 27. That's true for matter particles because they're conserved and they just spread out. Actually, it's not true for photons. They lose their energy due to redshift, never mind. But the point about dark energy is it doesn't get diluted with expansion. So when you 
expand those boxes, more of it is made. There's more of it. It actually comes out, it's made out of gravity, actually. So it's a very unusual substance. And it has a remarkable effect. And that is that it causes the, the universe, the universe's expansion to accelerate and speed up. Now that's the only, okay, I've just said a lot there. That's the only quality that we know about it because the way it's, it's the way the evidence for it is simply that the universe is speeding up in its expansion, not slowing down, it's speeding up, it's accelerating. Now what it actually is, is not known, but there are three clear possibilities. One is, it's a residual energy of space itself, which sounds like an oxymoron, because space, you think, is a vacuum and therefore it has no energy. But remember, in modern quantum field theory or quantum mechanics, the vacuum is a very different kind of entity than the Newtonian vacuum. There's activity within it. There are quantum fields that permeate it. Using a slightly different language or term, you could say the knowledge of the laws of physics are in the vacuum. And it transpires that they weigh something. There is an energy associated with that knowledge, with those fields. That is called a vacuum energy. And vacuum energies don't dilute with expansion. So that's the primary candidate for what dark energy is. And there are a couple of others. It could be that Einstein's general relativity needs modifying slightly, it isn't quite correct. And then there's another possibility called quintessence, which is that it's a quantum field which is decaying slowly. The current evidence supports the vacuum energy as being the primary, its primary nature. But I think it's very, very nice to recognize that we fundamentally don't understand that nature, and yet it adds up to 96% of the contents of the universe. So there are, it means that cosmology is in a great state. You sorted a lot of stuff out, but there's clearly things that we don't yet um, figured out. We kind of know how it behaves. That's not the same as knowing what it is. As you mentioned, vacuum is different from nothing. Uh, in a documentary named Story of Everything, uh, Professor Jimal Khalili mentions that the vacuum is different from nothing and the universe came from exact nothing. So he mentions Big Bang as the moment of creation, like you did. Uh, but some other physicists think that Big Bang was a regular quantum spark that we can observe today. I'm sorry, the real what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, then some other physicists yes. think that uh, Big Bang was a quantum spark that we can observe today in laboratories, you know. Uh, and this confusing for ordinary people like me. What do you think uh, about Big Bang? Is it a special moment of creation? Was there an environment before the Big Bang that we can apply the rules of physics? Or is it a regular quantum spark that uh, could occur any time? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, so just to repeat the question I was after asking to do that. Um, the question really concerns what is either my or in general the thought about how the Big Bang itself was created. Was there a prior time to it or not? And was that event, some people have said, and you use the term quantum spark, it's a new, I haven't heard that term before, but I understand in, in, inferring what it means. Is it possible that we could actually, perhaps by mistake, in our accelerators, create a version of the Big Bang right here, which might then actually destroy everything? So, is that sort of partly what you're asking? I, never mind. I think, I, think it, I think, let me talk around those topics, because I think that's... Sorry, I don't want to reformulate your question for you. Uh, yeah, I imagine the being from nothing, you know, in quantum mechanics. Yes, 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 yeah. from nothing. Yeah. Okay. But they came from vacuum. Yes, 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 gotcha. Right. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to play the agnostic game again. Because uh, the, so in other words, the first thing one should say is we don't know. So that's that's very important. It's very important to understand that part of, almost all of the story I told you is on very firm footing, but that's not what you're asking about. And I didn't address, I mean, I could do, I'm happy to, the notion of what actually made the Big Bang start in the first place. I haven't discussed inflation here, 
uh, or anything like that. I, I picked up the story, if you notice, 100 years after the Big Bang, was the very first simulation that began there. Um, I would say that we're on fairly firm footing back to about one second after the Big Bang, and in many ways, we think we know what's going on back to about a millisecond. Now, prior to that, one doesn't really know, and as you must realize, it is thought that the creation moment itself was much prior to that, in a, in a logarithmic sense. It's those 10 to the minus 20 seconds or something, but very, very tiny. But it is also, you must realize, that once you, trans, once you go before one second, it's just much more uncertain what's going on. And once you go past what our accelerators can create, so the CERN, the Large Hadron Collider right now, can reach back to about a thousandth of a picosecond. So 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And this is beyond the electroweak scale, because that comes in at about 100 GeV, and the Large Hadron Collider is at 7 TeV. So you push beyond there. We hope it's just beginning to get to the energies at which the dark matter particle is being made. But that's still late, late, compared to what we think inflation is about. So quite how inflation began, and incidentally, if you've not heard that term before, that is the modern theory of the sea which created everything out of very, uh, it's a sea. Quite how the sea arose, and there's more to the story than I'm able to tell you right now. How the sea arose is really not known. The pre-inflation the pre world, there are ideas about what might happen and what our current understanding of physics might allow to happen, but nobody, unless they're fibbing, unless they're lying, Nobody is confident about what happened. Now then, some people do say that a quantum fluctuation can generate an appropriate seed. These seeds are incidentally remarkable things. They're very tiny and they don't weigh much, but they have a remarkable property. Their vacuum is both dense and, uh, and it doesn't dilute. And that's, once you get a seed big enough, uh, gravity takes over and this seed just exponentially falls out and doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles and it makes energy out to gravity, keeping everything, keeping the total energy constant at nearly zero. So it's an energy conserving process. The universe is full of matter and energy and you and I add up to a lot of joules or kilograms of the same thing, remember. But there's negative joules of gravitational field between all the galaxies and when you add it all up, there's as much negative energy in the gravity as there is positive energy in you and me. The whole thing sums to nothing, which is what gives currency, validity, to the idea that maybe the universe came out of nothing. Because the total is currently nothing. So maybe it started from nothing. Now the mechanism that did that, inflation, itself needs to have a starting point, a seed. You're asking, how did that happen? Do I have any feelings about that, and the answer is I don't. I mean, I'm ignorant, really, of that kind of branch of cosmology, but I would suspect anybody who says they knew what was happening, but we don't, we don't. Now, as to whether a quantum process, a spark, could be, by mistake, created here in the laboratory, perhaps by the Large Hadron Collider, that is clearly a false concern. And the reason is, nature is a much better particle accelerator than we are. Out in the galaxy, magnetic fields and shock waves from supernova remnants, we actually not quite know. They can generate particles vastly more energetic than the Large Hadron Collider. They're very rare, but the galaxy is a big place. And so there have been collisions of energies much higher than the Large Hadron Collider over billions of years, and nothing has ever happened. There have been no other galaxies suddenly spawning an entire universe. We haven't been decimated by another universe being created. So I, have, I can sleep at night knowing that the Large Hadron Collider is happy, bashing particles together. I am not concerned in the slightest that those are going to generate a quantum spark, which uh, generate a, a, a false vacuum which expands and destroys everything at the speed of light. Actually, you can sleep at night anyway because you wouldn't know it was about to happen. It expands at the speed of light. You can have no idea what was happening and in fact your sleep would just be terminated. But either way, you needn't worry about it. And I think you'll wake up tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, one last uh, and very short question. Uh, here's one. And this 
the last one. Okay, maybe. Okay, maybe it's a simple one compared to the previous profound questions. Uh, in the slide in which you showed numbers, uh, like percentage of matter, like matter, like energy, and Hubble's constant, all had very little uncertainty in them, except for the uh, first stars, the time for the first stars, yes. there's something towards percentage. What's the, uh, what's the reason, particular reason for this? Yes, yes. Thank you. So the question was, I gave this gram. Excuse me, I gave a pie chart, a lot of numbers, and there was a lousy error, 30%. Okay. Um, and so that particular topic of when the first stars were formed um, will be nailed. Here we are, there it was. So it's this number here, the time of the first stars, 400 million years, 30% error. Let's just kill us out so um, the reason is that incidentally there's good news in the sense that the next generation of great telescopes the james webb space telescope for example should be able to actually see those stars and then it'll date them very very precisely first of all it wasn't a, the first stars it's a statistical thing so a few will form and then more will form and then from then on of course we have star birth but the very first stars will be a window here is how here is how that measurement comes about, and I think you'll realize why it has uh, quite a high uncertainty. The first stars are very, very massive and hot, uh, for reasons I won't well, if you'd like to see the frowning, maybe one could go into it, but the, 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 the hydrogen gas that's present at that time has no other elements in it, it's just hydrogen and helium. That kind of gas cannot cool very easily. If you know atomic physics, you may remember that the more complex an atom, the more the electrons can jiggle and the more photons are easily produced and they can cool gas. So carbon and iron and oxygen in a gas allow it to cool. This gas had no way of cooling very well. So the gas that collapsed to form the first stars was actually 500 Kelvin, whereas in today's universe, it's more like 50 Kelvin. When you have a, he a hot gas that's collapsing, uh, you end up with more making a star. So the stars weigh two or three hundred times as much mass as today's sun. Okay? Our sun is an average star today. In today's universe, there might be uh, 50 solar mass stars and 10 solar mass stars. But in the first stars, they were probably 300 solar mass, down to 100 solar masses. These are behemoths. They're enormous stars. They're very, very powerful because the weight is crushing down and making that furnace burn very virulently. And so uh, they, they're hot surfaces and they're great luminosity. They ultraviolet light ionizes the gas. And let's just be very clear about this. For 380,000 years, the entire universe became atomic because it cooled past 3,000 degrees. And then we go all the way to 200 million years, which in the metaphor of 80 years for the Try and follow this sentence, but it's a nice one. If you map all of 14 billion years into 80 years of human life, and you remember the microwave background is 12 hours after conception, just around nine months are the first stars. So during all of that period of human gestation, the stars are beginning to get assembled, and they turn on 200 million years. Actually, that says 400 of them, but we've updated that. That's why I said 30% there. It's more like 200 million years. And they re-ionize the gas. It has been atomic. But now their ultraviolet light re-ionizes the gas. It's a wonderful period called the epoch of re-ionization. Now, think about this for a moment. Oh, wait a minute. We've re-ionized the gas. Doesn't that scatter light? Isn't it foggy? Why can we see past that era? And the answer is the fog is now only a mist. The universe has expanded enough that it's only a mist. So when we look at the microwave background, we look through a thin mist at 200 million years after the Big Bang, then through transparency, then into the microwave background. Now that thin foreground mist makes the image of the microwave background slightly hazier than it would have been if the mist wasn't present. Now when the mist occurs, if it would have occurred earlier, it's a thicker mist. If it occurs later, it's a thinner mist because the universe is continually expanding. So the way you date the first stars is by judging 
how misty that little band is that you look through to see the microwave background beyond. <coughs> the effect is that it actually suppresses the higher harmonics. I won't go back to the graph, but you know the sound spectrum. It just it means you don't see good detail. It gets washed out of it, so it suppresses those. But it's not a big effect. It's not a big effect. And the data at that time, you can see, they're pretty bad error bars. So you couldn't constrain that suppression of the high, the visibility of the, of the small patches, the high harmonics. And ultimately, then you need to derive uh, um, a time of 400 million years plus or minus 30%. That's now being reduced in percentage, but it's still bad. It's still not an easy measurement to make. But it won't be too long from now, maybe the next decade, until optical telescopes will actually see the first stars for real not just their ionization, you understand? That method I described is targeting, measuring when they reionize the gas. It's not seeing the stars themselves. Yeah. What a technical question, but what a question. Well, I think it's the time to close. Thank you very much.